Luke chapter 14 is where we are at. Luke chapter 14. And we're reading from verse 15 to verse 35. And I'm going to read fast. It is a parable of a great banquet. All right. The parable of a great banquet. And it says, and now, when one of those who sat at the table with him had these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord, if that the Bible is yours, please underline with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, oh, please underline also make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And the second one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to test them. I ask, I ask you to have me excused. And the other one said, I have married a wife. Come on, here's somebody. And therefore... <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, I cannot come. Hallelujah. So those, that servant came and reported these things to his master. When the master of the house being angry, then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, master, it is done as you commanded. But there is still, but there is still, please underline if the Bible is yours, still there is room. Let's continue. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them, underline the word compel them, to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those who are invited shall taste my supper. Now great multitudes went with him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children, he cannot, on his life, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. In the two lines, if the Bible is yours, please underline, cannot be my disciple. All right. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. Saying, this man began to build what he was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all of what he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That is Bible for I said what I said. And that is the word of the Lord. Now, by the time we're getting to this portion of scripture, Jesus has been going about doing his ministry. He's been going about doing good. He's been going about uh, healing and saving and working great and mighty things. If you're looking for a working title, our working title is The Believer's Practice. And The Believer's Practice today is Counting the Cost. Counting the cost. Counting the cost. Now Jesus has been going about, he's been doing good. He's been doing the things that only God can do. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus. Classic Jesus to go around. Now one of the things, and we've said it here in the youth service before, one of the things that Jesus used to do oh so very much was to attend parties. Jesus went to many banquets and many parties. Jesus set the ball rolling for the believer. <laughs> it is a good place for you to reach other people. It is a good place for you. You see, in a party or at a banquet, you are not necessarily here. The code of conduct might not be what is here. But if your code of conduct there can be still Christ-like, then you can win people for the Lord. 
when I saw Sifiri. So Jesus used to attend many of these things. In fact, he had been hosted by a high-ranking official. He had been hosted by a person who was not, um, it was not one of his fellow ministers. Okay? He had been hosted by a high-ranking official, and he goes. And so the story going all the way from the top was him having been invited to a place to just go and eat and drink. And there are a lot of things that happen. Now, the thing about Jesus is that he was very against the culture of the day. And it was not the easy conversations. You know, when you're eating with somebody, especially at somebody's house, you don't want to offend that person. If you have gone on a date with somebody and you know so sure well that they are the ones who are paying for that date, you don't want to offend them. So the price for your silence or for your good manners is the plate of food. So you just sit down there, even when their views are not right. Somebody sits there and they're saying, hey, by the way, you know, these Christians, the way these days they're behaving themselves. Hey, me, I think this Christianity, by the way, people should just stop going around, going around, just making noise, this Christianity. It should be in the heart. And you are seated there, you know you love the Lord well, well with all your heart. You're just cutting into the chicken, cutting into it, filling your mouth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're hoping that your intonation will stand for you. He just said, mm, mm, I'm like, mm. I'm like, oh, yeah. But you can't say anything because but Jesus, we can learn a lot from him. In school, Zana school used to sing, I want to be like Jesus deep down in my, so deep, deep. That's right, so deep down in my heart, those people who skip Sunday school classes, there's redemption for us in the house today. So we want to be like Jesus deep down in our hearts. How was Jesus like? You look at the character of Jesus, and Jesus seated at that table. If you go through just above from verse um, 14 upwards, you find that the conversation that Jesus had started was not a good dinner time conversation. It was not a good conversation for the table. It was ruffling feathers. In fact, from where we started in verse, was it verse... 14, was it verse 14? Um, yes, from verse 15, from where we started. This one man that is speaking, he is exclaiming and he's speaking just to break the awkwardness. Have you been at an awkward dinner? Let me help you. I have myself. At a place where you're seated and you're just a table of people and the topics that are being discussed are just hot topics. And you just, you're like, ooh, ooh, ooh. you're just filling your mouth awkward dinner. So you're seated there. It was an awkward dinner. Jesus had ruffled feathers. He had said many things. In fact, some of the things that Jesus had said, said, when you give a dinner or a supper, a kokwa dinner, a meitua. Lakini anasema, when you give a dinner, do not ask your friends and your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors to come because they will also invite you back and you have there received your payment. But when you give a feast, invite the poor. I mean, wait, we are seated in this table. I have invited you to my house. Then you start telling me, you know, I have invited you to a feast, to a bash. You have invited you to my house, and you have invited you to your presents. You have invited you to your house, and 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 you have You're all seated at that table, you're just tense. You're just like, what is he saying? All of us have been invited. Why is he speaking like this? Can't he wait until the end of the dinner? Jesus. Now, another thing that Jesus says, just to, to take us a little bit there. He says to them, all of them have been seated. They have all been invited. They are all seated there. Now, in those days, let me just give some little bit of context. In those days, when you sat at a table and you've been invited by the guest, the person who sat closest to the guest showed a place of honor. Kopamoja. So the closer you are to the guests showed how honorable your invitation was. Kuna wale watu wa red sticker, kuna wale watu wa green sticker. Hapa huko DC ya KZ ni kuzuri. Ukipatiwa card ile ya parking, kuna moja imeandikwa VVIP, ingine imeandikwa VIP, ile ingine imeandikwa IP. Important person, na hiyo ndio ya mwisho. Sawa. Lakini huko kulingine kwenye tunaendanga so the closest you are to the guest showed how important you are or high, how high ranking you are in the society. But so people used to want to come and sit close at the high place. It used to be called the high place of the table. So if the table is a long table, so people wanted to come and sit. The closer you are to the guest, to the in, person who, not the guest, to the host. The closest you are showed how, that was high up the table. 
at the head of the table. So you've heard about head of the table. So going even in uko sani uko. That is the uko chini, lower in the table. Uko machinani ameza. Sawa. Uko ju sasa ni place of honor. So imagine people are seated at the table. Of course, Jesus is seated close. I will assume because he's been invited, and he used to bring throngs and crowds of people. But as they are seated, everybody is already seated. Everybody is already enjoying the feast. And then Jesus starts a conversation. And what does he say? If you are invited, go and sit down in the, long, in, in the, low, in the lowest place. Actually, he starts by saying, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place. People are already seated in the best place. People already walked in and took the place of honor. And then now Jesus starts this conversation. It is, the air is thin in that place. Everybody's just wondering, hey, <laughs> he's coming for me next. So everybody becomes silent. Unasikia tu sauti ya, cutlery na crockery. Chingling, chingling, kring, kring, You know, you just hear those sounds and you know it's getting real. So the person who breaks the silence, this our hero for the day, is this man who says, um, when one of those who sat at the table with him had these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, what this man is saying is true. We read about it in the book of, uh, of Revelation. It reminds us that there is a feast that is coming, the marriage feast of the Lamb. Have you read about it? A feast, a glorious feast is coming, and all of us are invited to it. I pray that all of us shall be partakers. May the Lord help us that we shall be partakers that day. So this man is saying the truth. Just in trying, I mean, it's a good statement. It's a safe statement. It's just to, if anything, to direct the conversation in a different direction. But Jesus, <laughs> Jesus says to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And then he begins now to read what we've just read. Now, the parable that Jesus has given, we've shared about it here before, but just for those of you who have not been here before, in those days, why this parable uh, is important, in those days when somebody used to throw a party, they didn't have social media, and they didn't have WhatsApp. You can just open a group and invite many people. They did not have e-cards that you can just hit send, send to many. They didn't have that. So in those days, it was very hard. They also didn't have catering services um, as such. So catering a great feast was not an easy thing. So they needed to go the extra mile to cook. And I don't know how many of you have taken time to, uh, I don't know how many of you follow those cooking channels on uh, in TikTok or Instagram or on YouTube, and you follow some of those cuisines for the Middle East. Their food is not githeri. Okay. They, you don't just put everything in one pot. It... <laughs> You don't just put anything, everything in one pot. You, they take time to prepare. Unaona kuna item one na item two. Na mkate inapikwa from scratch. Kuna kitu inaitua sourdough. Iyo inamaliza watu kutengeneza sourdough bread. Inamaliza watu kweli kweli. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. And it is okay. It is no condemnation. But... For you to start making, you want to make lasagna, for instance, but you're not buying the whatever. What are they called? The, 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 you're not, yes, that is a chef. chef. Chef Pastor D is telling us what they are called. You're not buying the lasagna sheets in the supermarket. You make them from scratch. I was giving a story to a few people. In 2017, um, uh, I think in the month of May or June, uh, myself and uh, Pastor Millicent and Pastor Kaunda were sent by Bishop to Tabora uh, to a, a, a youth conference that they had there. And it was so interesting. We traveled by bus. Tabora is far, okay? From Arusha, which is already far from Nairobi, about four hours. From Arusha, it is another, I think, is it 16 hours? It is when in Bali, by bus, okay? So we went. We had traveled and we went. The people there, the culture is very relaxed. It's a lot like coast. They don't have evening revivals. Evening revival in Aisha 6. It's not Mali Kuzuri. In the morning service, the very early morning service in the conference was starting at like, I don't know, 10. I, it was just easy, relaxed. So we used to wake up at 5 to go and pray together with the team of, uh, we, we were serving with, with Pastor Millicent, Pastor Kaunda, and um, uh, their pastoral, the team that was helping us to serve in the conference. So we used to wake up. When we would wake up, because we were staying in the bishop's house, when we would wake up, going out now to the office where we were praying from, we would find at five, we would wake up at five to go for prayer, and we would find women 
bless the Lord. In Siari, they used to tell us the role of women in the ministry of Jesus. We would find women up at five. They are cooking in silence because we're in the house. They don't want to wake us up. But wamekanda unga, five. Wamekanga vitu, five. Kuna nuke, unamshwa na arufu ya chakula. You know, you're sleeping and in your dream, you're just turning, you're like, ay, niko teligani, mandhari, unasikia, arufu. So you just awake, you arise, and you're wondering, what is, what is all this goodness at this and godly hour. You just wake up and you find just women in silence in the sitting room. Wengine wanakanda, wengine wanafanya. So that gives me a bit of a picture of that, how banquets used to be prepared back in the day. Now, for that reason, people used to be sent for Unambiwa, save the date, 5th of April. Hallelujah. Una... <laughs> it was right there. <laughs> so they used to say, save the date, but they wouldn't give you the time. It's not like today. Now you have the time. But then they wouldn't give you the time. Because the time of when the party begins would depend on when the guest has, the host has finished cooking. So, Nyim Nambiwa, we just save the date. Clear your whole day. Where would you have to end up? Kwa? Mashigadi. Alafu masa, we wache ya mungu. Somebody will come and tell you. Now they would prepare and prepare. When the feast was ready, they would send a servant to go out. The servant would go out crying and saying, the feast is ready. The feast is ready. Where would he go to say the feast is ready? To the houses of the people who had already confirmed their attendance. It was not a random place. They were not just standing up a Shiloh. Anayaka kimero ikiangalia uko. Anasema kimeiva kujeni. No, they would go to specific homes of the people who had RSVP'd and said they're going to be there. And so they would go around and say the feast is ready. That's why this story has so much significance. Because these were the people who had said, I am coming. But now when everything is ready, if you go back to the story, Jesus is saying that the, 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 the host said, everything is now ready. I want you to imagine, those of you who host people, the pressure you feel when you hear, wamefika wapi, wako wapa mirema. Na haujamaliza kufagia. Bado ukuna maunga kwa mikono. Bado ile kitamba iko kwa nini. Dera lenyewe, chaf kwa kweli. Haujamaliza. See, you get so much pressure. You wonder, ni dera, ni kitamba, ni nini, ni taingiza mvunguni. Unarusha sufuria uko chini zenye uliku unapikia. Watu wanaingia wanaona, wow. Lakini mtu wakisema, can I go and wash my hands? Wacha ni kuletea maji. Watcha ni kuletea majwe ni mgeni wangu usinuke. It is not that they have a heart of service. It is that you came before that you are finished. I have hosted people a couple of times. Me, myself, me, Brian Mashigadi, me, in this like this by myself. And let me just tell you where. See, I have been caught when the guests are at the gate. There's a day I made them wait there for like 10 minutes. Wangoche ni malize. Nilikuwa ni mesema tu. Munakuja aje tu. Anyway, so when they went out, they are starting to say, oh, the, the feast is ready, the feast is ready. When everything is ready, and then now you start to wait for the guests, you start to get agitated, isn't it? Umeketi ume, una, walikuwa kuje tu, ni 2.30, everything is ready for ready. Ata ile majia kuosha mikono, umesha ichemsha, sasa inapoa. Utarudi zena kuichemsha? Najua gas ni 2600. No, 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 no. It's just, it's giving no. So the frustration is when we come and we say that everything is now set, you're supposed to leave. You, you follow me going to the feast. Kisije kikapoa, manake akukwa na microwave usikuizo kwa kweli, sindo? I have an aunt of mine, my mom's eldest sister, and when she cooks, when she makes dinner, whenever she's around, she doesn't live around, but whenever she's around and she will make a special meal, and she says, dinner will be ready in 15. She doesn't live in Kenya, so... Where she lives, it is, you see that in the movies. No. Dinner will be ready in 15. Upper Kenya, dinner will be ready when it will be ready. <laughs> but she will tell us, ah, in about 15 minutes, dinner will be ready. So you're supposed to go about your business. Your 15 zile vitu neza fanya we fanya. Lakini usi chue kazi yenye iko more than 15 minutes. Don't get into a meeting. Yenye itachukue more than 15 minutes. Sindo. When she says, dinner is ready, her expectation is that all of you should go to the place where the food is. Kama ni kwa meza, ama kama ni kwa dining table, or whatever. When you don't show up, she starts complaining. The food is getting cold. It took us a lot of time to adjust. Because us, we don't do it that way. Here, we make the food, and we announce... Chakula imeiva? Mtu atasava kisav, sindio? Eh, utapitana tuko na unwana... Ana, mama yako wakiingie vijikoni ya naona mchele bado yuko hivi ya ijachotwa. Anauja kwani ya mkuli? 
Nasema ah tunakuja tunakuja. You can eat some of you saa tisa. Watu wamelala wanasikia jikoni. <laughs> this is the right service to talk about these things. Ndio. Ni kama mtwa. Any people people who went to bed early wamelala wanafikiria kumekujwa. Kumbe ni wewe umeingia jikoni. Anyway, so the expectation was that by the time they say dinner is ready or the, the feast is ready, you're supposed to come. So these very people that had confirmed their attendance were the same people that are giving excuses. That is why the master is angry. Because why would you confirm and then not come? What has changed between now and then? As I was reading a certain commentary, I thought to myself, is it that when they were being invited, they had not yet done these things? They had not purchased these things? And then their reasoning is also quite off. The one who is saying, I have bought a piece of land. I want to go and check it out. Aren't you doing things the wrong way? You're supposed to check out the field before you buy it. Or I have bought a team of oxen. Five teams of oxen. I'm supposed to, you're, you're supposed to test them out. So you know, you a test drive. Unachukua gari unaipeleka uu. Bishop alituambia, tembea ditidobi. Vangu yako smart. Ingie uko ditidobi. Unambia, how much is this one? Ini AMG Mercedes. Nostaki. Ni ebui. Mm, can I? Naweza injeribu. Mm, unatoka unazunguka nayo hivyo alafu unakuja. It's not hugging my back the way I wanted to hug my back. <laughs> Sasa unajua hata wakikupatia size. <laughs> Wakambia unaweza ukailipa na 5 years. Unasema bado sitaki. Hata 10 years sitaki. Anyway. It's supposed to be the other way around. And then there's another one who says that he got, he married an excuse. Kweli si kweli. Anakuja anasema, I got married. So I have to, I'm thinking, you can come with your wife though. Ama? Uhu mtu wangekua mepata na pasta ali zangeambiwa, awendi bila mdiyo wae wako, sindio? Unafa, unabeba, mroe wako. <laughs> Unampeleka mali mnaenda. Sini kweli. But these are excuses. Now, I want to take you back a little bit to where we said we need to underline. Now, the Bible says these people with one accord. All of them had different reasons, but all of them were doing the same thing. In togetherness, all of them were rejecting or rescinding what they had said before. Now, again, the Bible uses the word in the New King James. It says they begin to do what? To make excuses. And I thought about that word. I thought about it this morning. I thought it is making excuses. How interesting that excuses are Made. You formulate it. It is neither here nor there. It does not exist. You just make it. It's just like a lie. It is not truth. You make it up. You see, the fact that you make excuses for anything shows that there was no willingness in the first place. It shows that you were not really looking. It was not serious. You you know those of us who confirm things to people? And then when the day comes, you're like, oh, oh. Or you made plans with somebody and then you knew for sure you were not going to come, but you were hoping they will cancel before you cancel. And then they don't cancel. And you realize time is there. We're meeting in 30 minutes and they're not canceling. They really wanted to meet you. And you had no intention. Wewe acha ukomoyale njiani kisafiri. Na mnapatana kibwezi. Ata ukitaka na ndege. <laughs> I mean, so, we make excuses. It shows a lack of willingness right there from the beginning. Now, this is talking about the kingdom, that Jesus has made an invitation to the people. That's why the master got so angry. Now, just moving away from that as we continue to, uh, to land it. As we're thinking about why the master got so angry, he gets so angry and he says, go out. Go out and invite everyone. Tell them to come. And he does exactly that. And he comes and he says, there's what? There's still room. And he says, go out. Because the feast that had been intended will still be had. Now, I read that and I thought to myself, imagine this great invitation to the banquet feast of the Lord. And some of us are still dilly-dallying and refusing to come in. The invitation is still there. But it... it struck me as I read it to think that whether I say yes to the invitation or not, the feast will still happen. And that was such a wake-up call for me as a young person. And I pray that it is a wake-up call for us as well. Because whether or not we respond to the invitation, the feast will still happen. 
There's not going to be time or waiting around. It's not going to be canceled. Jesus is not going to say, okay, today, when, the, when, the, when, the, when God says, now is the time, my son, go. Go take your bride. When he says that, he's not going to look around and say, ah, oh, no, 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 no. Um, siku imefika lakini hawajakubali. No, the feast is still going to happen. And that's what happened. When the Jews had been given the open invitation and they rejected it, the door was opened up also for us, the Gentiles. When Jesus Christ came, the door has been opened for you and I. That's why the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that is the widest invitation that has ever been made, whosoever, anybody can come. The rich can come, the poor can come, the filthy can come, the clean can come, the illiterate can come, the learned can come, anyone can come. The vilest offender who truly believes, that very moment from Jesus, he receives a pardon. Anyone can come to the feast. Whether or not I say yes or I respond to it will not stop the feast from happening because he means business who set up the feast. I pray that the Lord is going to stir us up to think about it. So we've been given this invitation. Now as we continue with the journey of Jesus Christ, then he, he calls them and he says, go out and bring all these people. And they continue. And so they leave the feast and now they're in a place towards Jerusalem where now there's a big multitude that is following Jesus, as was very common in his day. Wherever he would go, you would call him an influencer because he really, really did pull the crowds. Now, they, he, um, he turned to them and he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, if anyone comes to me and does not hate even his own life, cannot be my disciple. Now, you remember we underlined cannot in two different places. He says, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, verse 27, cannot become my disciple. When Jesus is saying, does not hate, what does that mean? When Jesus is saying, does not hate his people, does not hate his own life, does it mean that you're supposed to just go at your people and tell them, I hate you all. I've decided my life belongs to Jesus. Last Sunday when Harriet was speaking, she, was, she finished in a place of thinking about, um, of, of calling us into making the decision, I have decided to follow Jesus. Now that deciding to follow Jesus has to do with you considering what you are getting into. And that is what we call counting the cost. You see, very many of us believers, when we come into the faith, we do not pause for a second to think, to consider, what have I truly done? Sometimes we can blame, it is that in the fact that the Lord has gripped your heart, he has gripped you. The conviction of the Holy Spirit has taken you. You cannot fight it. You say, yes, Lord Jesus. Many of us, if we give our stories about how we gave our lives to Christ, in that moment, you had not even planned to do it. In tears and in sackcloth. You are a sorry sight to behold. The pastor is holding you. His suit is just, oh, soiled. They receive you. So in that moment, you might not think about many things. But you see, the good thing about the gospel or this great salvation we've been given is that it has not been forced down our throat. We have been allowed to pause and to allow air into the room. It is not a stuffy salvation. We have not been put down and told, you cannot leave. You cannot do anything about this. You are now mine. We are not here in bondage. It is an invitation that is made to us. He says, take my yoke upon you Sindio Biblia nasema Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light We know that we have been saved from that yoke into the yoke of salvation the yoke of righteousness but even then that yoke cannot be compared to that other yoke it is incomparable but even though it is still a yoke, we submit ourselves to it. That's why we make a prayer and we say, come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. I submit myself to you. I have decided to follow Jesus. Now, many of us in that moment, when we are making that decision, and it is an everyday decision. It is Rebecca Don that likes to say, you give your life to Christ on one day. And then every day after that is a day of daily surrender. Must be a day that you count the cost. You think, I want to follow Jesus. I decided, yes, but every day I have to decide, do I want to follow Jesus? 
I read a book in high school. I've read it here before. I've said it here before called Just Who Will You Be by Maria Shriver. And in the book, she's asking herself, exactly who do you want to be? Every day you must ask yourself that question. As a believer especially, you must call yourself into account. You must sit with yourself down and ask yourself, just who do you want to be? If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, then be a disciple. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, in the message paraphrases it, it says, therefore, if you have decided to live this new life in Christ, act like it. That is what counting the cost is all about. We decide I am going to sit down and I am going to think, what does it take to be a disciple? So that when pastor comes and tells me, Mwashigadi, what you are wearing is not Christ-like. It is not giving Jesus. I am not saying, oh, you know, my dress, my choice. No, 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 no. I must have sat down and counted the cost one day. And I knew that in this new life I have come into, I will be asked to dress a certain way. You see, we do it so flawlessly in the systems of the world. Those of you who are lawyers in this place, you will tell us, you do not just present yourself to court in your luminous green pants and your bright yellow top before the judge. I have come to represent my client. Which client? <laughs> Can you go and dress in something that is not burning our own eyes? So they will tell you, come with the navy blues, come with the dark colors, come with the dark grays, you know? But they, they, they have been prescribed to a certain way. There are some of us who are like, Me ni kimali za high school. Sita wai takakuona uniform. Mahali. Haya basa, uta wai kuwa pilot. Tosheka na iyo. Nisawa. Enda uku ile kazi unataka kufanya, lakini ujue kuna kazi zingine we. Hey. Wazi uka kuwa sergeant. Unless Niko uko Baghdad in the place of war. Mali akuna hizo mascrubs. Otherwise, if I'm going to work in these regular hospitals, I must. Kuna code of conduct. Ama namna gani? Before I get into the profession, I have counted the cost. Why is it acceptable for us to count the cost in the things of the world? But when it comes to the things of God, we refuse to count the cost. We are saying, Mami hapana, I'm not kazia salvation, I'm not kazia sana. Sam mtu wata, mtu waizia kava ile, nguwe. Vaa uko nyumbani. Ulale nayo ni sawa kwa nyumba unaosha na hiyo nini unataka kuosha na ni sawa lakini ukitokeleza hivi kwa watu kama wewe ni mkristo lazima utakuwa ume count the cost you see another thing that counting the cost helps us to do which i had already alluded to is that counting the cost saves us from this thing called offense we've talked about it here many times before if pastor paul has counted the cost of being a minister in this house and he does something wrong <laughs> if Pastor Paul, for instance, has given an example, um, an, an easy example of the worship team. Pastor Paul is a, is, a, is a member of the worship team. He does many things, he sings, he plays, and so on and so forth. We say we have practice at a certain time, and when he comes for practice, our job as singers is to, I don't play an instrument yet, um, our job as, instrument, as singers is to listen to the songs so that we can know our parts. Then their job as instrumentalists is to listen to the, the playing, the chords, the keys, those things that I don't concern myself with, okay? Um, when he comes for practice, and not just him, the other instrumentalists will tell you that, all of them must have listened to their parts. Even Rogers, who plays the drums, they must listen to their parts. And you should be here for Ibada practice. When they have not listened to their parts, the practice must stop. And they must point the person who did not listen to their part. Wewe unatrudisha nyuma, wewe unatrudisha nyuma. Wewe unatrudisha nyuma. Now, Pastor Paul cannot say, me, I am a busy man. You guys cannot be telling me that. Pastor Paul is a CEO of his own um, organization. KCCO, Ndioyo, Kingdom Community Care Organization. Watch any plug. In youth service, inspiration. man of God, I receive. Hallelujah. Anyway, so he's a busy man. We know he's a busy man, but he's also a part of this team. He is required to do the things that people must do in this team. So when he shows up, whether he has come from, he comes from Isiolo, he says the outermost parts of the world, he must serve his parents in that place. If he was preaching a whole revival there, great, let souls are perishing, let him preach. And I'm just using him as an example. Okay, he's a wonderful man of God. 
And then he has come to Nairobi. And in Nairobi, he's a highly sought after um, minister. And he has been invited to another place to go and minister. Let him go and minister. No problem with that. And then he's also a businessman. He must sit down and write proposals. Let him sit and write proposals. But he's also a son in this house. And so he's been assigned by bishop or mom to go and do something. He will do those things. But then in all those things, he must look for time to listen to those songs. So that when he comes here, he's not telling us, you know, the bishop has sent me, even if the president had sent you, great. But I am sure the day you joined this team, you counted the cost. What does it take for me to also be a member of this team? When we count the cost, it will save us another thing. It will save us. Let me finish that point. So that when he's being corrected, he does not say, oh, you guys, you guys, he does not take offense with us. Sindio. Now, the other thing that counting the cost saves us from doing is that it saves us from exhaustion. It saves us from pulling ourselves, being stretched too thin. A lot of us here who are in service, you know in your family, where in your tengemeo? Tengemeo kwanjami yenu. You are the one that the people are looking up to. And that's great. That is a blessing, by the way. See, sometimes many young people are walking around and saying, oh, I don't mean you to school fees. I don't mean you to have to pay for school fees. I don't mean you to have to pay for school fees. I don't mean you to have to pay for school fees. So, you don't have to pay for school we unakenda kwa mungu, unapiga mungu, unasema mungu, unaona ile majukumu yote ni konayo, ni panulie hema yangu. Hii, hey, hii nda maombi tunaomba. We are not asking for more people to go away. So that your money, little money can be enough. No, you think big. Yesterday the bishop in the G12 was preaching to us about vision. You think big. You stretch your vision. You see a clear future kule mbele. You say, God, add more responsibility and stretch the tent of my habitation. You make the prayer of Jabez that Pastor Paul was reminding us about the other day. Oh, that you would bless me and bless me indeed. Hallelujah. So it keeps you from being stretched thin. So uko unategemewa nyumbani na hiyo ni sawa. Unategemewa kwa ofisi yenu, you know if you ukienda leave siku mbili kampuni bomoka. And that's okay. Hata hiyo umepatiwa na Mungu, si ni kazi, ulitisha. Tunaambia anga ukitisha kazi ni kufaa. Kama utaki unato. Alafu sasa unaongeza prayer request? <laughs> Haya umetegemewa pia ofisini, umetegemewa kazini, umetegemewa kila mahali. That's all great. Good. Unajua pia uko kwenye uhusiano. Na uhusiano wako, mpoa wako mnaendana na ye, pia si mtu laisi, si low maintenance, bas mshakuta. Ni mtu ambaye ni hai? High maintenance, ni mwajua watu high maintenance, bana. Si mnawajua? Lazima utume compulsory good morning sunshine text. Sindio? Compul if you don't send it, you see the way the sun is not shining today. Somebody slept on the job. Some of you are in relation, and by the way, let me tell you, even for that one, you cannot be complaining to us. You cannot be saying you are miserable. Kwa ni mefungu huko ndani? Si mwenyewe umeamua ukasema nataka mapenzi haya? Na ye haka kwambia, mina ataka kwambia good morning kila siku. Kama haungeweza, unasema siku ya kwanza kwamba? Mimi ya maneno ya simu siwezani? Tunapatana three days a week. Na ila sio siku za midweek na si siku ya Monday players. So tunapatana Tuesday, tunapatana? That's the siku ya sell jamani. Tunapatana Tuesday, tunapatana Saturday, na tunapatana Sunday after church. Kwa ni namna gani? Ndio maana vijana amwendi sell. Kumbe ndio. Ah. I I know. Uh, when I come back we shall talk about these things. Anyway. <laughs> so you have gotten into that relationship again by your own so you are stretched so thin. In your family, they need your attention. In your place of work, they need your attention. Here in church, we need your attention. And we are not going to apologize for needing your attention. Because again, you brought yourself to the service. Atuju mliambiana na mungu nini? Aka kukoroga. Uka kuja ukanambia Pastor Wanjala. Pastor Brian, me I want to be used by God. Use me in the service. And Pastor Alice will tell you. If there is a place where to kona kazi nyingi ya watu. Hapa. This is KZ. Kazi ya ikuishi. Hata ni wewe unalala tu, unapigana na mungu. When you hear the voice of the Lord today, harden not your heart. Just come and tell us, I want to serve. Na bishop alituambia, hata kama ile department unataka kuserve, haiko, tutakupatia where we head. Na uite wengine wakuja ndani. So we are going to, your place of work ni uulitisha kazi, 
they will require your attention. Your family, you can do nothing about it, they will require your attention. That relationship you took yourself there, they need your attention. Here in church, you brought yourself, we need your attention. Now, what will save you from being stretched and over exhaustion is counting the cost. Before you can join another thing, because sometimes we react emotionally as believers. You're sitting in the service and you're saying, oh, we are, like today we, we want to invite all those of you who want to join the security team. There's a slot for you that is open. You can come up to any one of us, the pastors, and we will plug you. Come on, my cook, Tamani, serve a security team. Let me please request, this was not in my sermon, but let me request all the ladies who serve in the security team, please stand. Ladies who serve in the security team. All right. Naona, ndioao, wakauko. So I made them, thank you very much, the Lord bless you. Ni mawafanya wasimame ndio hata ladies mjue kuna nafasi inyu kwa security team. Sao, sao? Yes. So, when you hear that call, you might want to respond emotionally. But before you do that, please sit down and count the cost. Because the last thing, might not be the last, but for our sharing today, the last thing that counting the cost will save you from is from being a disappointment. I am going to host, let me give an example with daughters on bended knees. I am going to be the, the I'm, I'm going, I want to tuongoza maombi ya daughters on bended knees. Unendea pastor bitches unambia, pastor bitches, nasikianga watu wakiomba huko, nasikianga, mtu anafanyanga nini. Nasema, oh, we can add you. Unataka kujoin siku gani, unataka kulid, we'll give you a day. When they allocate you a day, it is the day that you have everything. Lakini unasema, it is okay, it is okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Sasa hiyo ndiyo siku yenye umetumwa field. Ndiyo wewe uko. Kitui. Umetumwa mali uko. Kwa boda uko. Ukasi uko. <laughs> Ata hakuna network. Umekatalia uko. Sa una, unaanza kungangana. Unaanza kusumbua watu wenyu wa kazini. Nalazima mnirudisha yadi muingi mali kuna network. Nikae two hours kwa meeting ya Zoom. Mindi onaungoza. Unajuhu ki count the cost. It will save you from being a disappointment. You will sit down and you will ask yourself, am I able to do this thing? And we have been taught here in this church, no is an anointed word. No, kusema tu no. Sema, sorry, I'm not able to do it. Nobody will tell you, ah, we sasa umeanguka, sasa wewe uko kwa dhambi wewe. Nobody. It's okay. It's fine. When you're able to, please come back. Ama na again. Mambo ikikuwa mazito, mazito sana. Sit down and start to count the cost. When you count the cost also, it's not just a call for you to just say no now to everything. Now I'm dropping everything. I want to free my life now. I'm counting the cost. Let me free my life. That's not what I'm saying, please. Lest we start seeing just resignations in the ministry everywhere. Resignations. No. You sit down, you count the cost. You're asking yourself, how, how am I able to manage myself better? What can I give my time to? As I'm preaching to you, I'm also preaching to myself. Let me use that line by Pastor Paul. You count the cost. You sit down and you think about these things. You think about them. Including being a follower of Jesus Christ. Because all these things we are doing, whether it is in a relationship or in your family or at your place of work, you're doing them as a witness. You remember we went through the series about the believer's practice to be a witness? You remember that? Whatever I do, I'm doing it as a witness of Jesus. That you, I'm thinking I must follow Jesus. Now that sets the priority. As you're counting the cost, as you're removing all things from your life, the thing that remains at the top is Jesus Christ. You must hate your life, hate your ministry, not your ministry. If, okay, even your ministry. If it is taking the place of Jesus. Jesus must be number one. Remember a song here that Pastor Angeshi led us some time back. Is he number, number ten? No. Number seven. Number two. Is he number six? Number one? Yes, 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 yes. Jesus? <laughs> number one. He must remain top priority. That's the whole idea of hating everything else. So that you can be. If you do not hate it, you cannot underline it twice. You cannot be my disciple. What is a disciple? A learner and a discipline. Sindio, that I am allowing myself to be taught by Jesus. And how does Jesus teach me? He teaches me through his Holy Spirit. He teaches me through his servants. He teaches me through his word. See your revelation. That's okay. But you cannot be a disciple if you do not decide. I am, I, you have to count the cost. And let me just say again, even in the relationships that we are getting into, ladies and gentle people. Hallelujah. Kama utaki basi uta? Bas. I want you to lift up your voice and ask the Lord to help you. You know the areas where you've not been counting the cost. 
and we have talked about what counting the cost will do for you. So you know, in some areas you have been a disappointment. People are calling you all the time. They are telling you you are dropping the ball. You are doing badly. You are doing horribly. Please. You, you need to do something. You need to up your game. Some of you in your places of work, you've been placed um, in the red books or in the black books. People are just, you're just almost being fired. Because you have so many things. You're not, you're barely showing up at work. You're barely showing up here. When you sit down to count the cost with the help of the Holy Spirit, you're able to set things right. You're able to be a better manager of time. It keeps you from overexhaustion. Your life has more value. It becomes more meaningful. You enjoy the joy of salvation. Some of us are falling into cyclic sins because we have refused to count the cost. We are refusing to count the cost. So we, we get so much pressure and then we find ourselves falling back into the things we used to do to relieve pressure back in the day. Now Jesus is rest for weary souls. As you count the cost, you must come to him that he may teach you how to be a witness, that he may make you a learner and a discipline. Maybe the business that you just started is not sustainable, not because you can't do it, but because you can't do it in this season. Ask the Lord to help you. Maybe you didn't count the cost. Ask him to help you. Ask him to help you. Even the investments we make, maybe you're thinking about making an investment, but you haven't counted the cost. You don't know how it's going to affect you. Ask the Lord to help you so that you will, people will not look at you and they are laughing at you because you started this project and you cannot finish. It saves you from being a laughing stock. Father, we ask that you would hear the cry of your people as we call out to you today in the name of Jesus. And everyone that is calling out to you, we pray that you're going to listen, that you're going to answer, and that, Lord, you would help us by your grace. Help us to be disciples. Help us to be witnesses. Help us to despise everything around us and to follow you, to be your disciple to take up the cross and to run hard and fast after you. Help us to count the cost in Jesus' name.